On a day after the snow had fallen, we went up hunting in Lake Hughes area in California. There were four of us hunting that day, my dad and myself and two good buddies. Well, the deer hunting was not that good that day. So, one of my buddies said to us, my wife's uncle is gone from his cabin and won't be back anytime soon. So, why don't we visit his land and all and just hang out and all have some lunch? Well, he lives by Lake Hughes Road and close to where we were. We went over there and unlocked the gate as he had a key. We went in there and had brought some apples for lunch and all. We seen he had hogs and started feeding them these apples. After about a half hour of doing this, we heard the horses behind the house or cabin running around and making all kinds of noise. We could not see what was going on as the house was in the way. But man, were they going nuts. So we all said to each other, let's get over there and see what's up. We did and could not see anything but the horses still going nuts and running in circles. We then looked over this fence and through a gate and seen these huge footprints and smelt something like a dog that's been wet and rotten eggs mixed. Well, the gate was locked and he went inside the cabin or house and got a key for the gate. I went over to the prince and I'm 6'5 at the time and weighed about 275 pounds. I have a shoe size of 15 4E. Those tracks were much bigger than my shoe and they were made with some of them in the snow. I stepped next to them and could not press down and going that deep. I could maybe go three fourths to a full inch down. These prints were four inches deep. They were also two to three inches longer than my foot and much wider. Then I tried to step that far with my step and no way that I could. Then we followed the tracks until they came to this really steep hill. There, this thing went up this hill on two legs and stepped high enough that even my good buddy, who was a bodybuilder in great shape, could not climb. I could not even lift my leg that far, and I was 16 years old and pretty limber. No man could lift their leg that high or step that far. Nowhere did we see any bear tracks, and even if we did, they don't walk that far on two legs. Whatever this was, it walked along this fence and turned and went back into the woods, and then up this very steep hill. It must have looked at the horses and maybe seen us feeding the hogs. I never seen it, but we got scared and left the ranch. I have told this story to a few people, and they look at me like it could be, but you can tell that they don't think this is real. But when you see things like this, you just know something is out there. Nobody could change my mind on this one, as I know what I have seen, and it is not a setup. Nobody knew we were going to his ranch, and the next ranch over, nobody was home either. So, the only thing that it could be is that it was real and not fake. Nowhere did we see any human footprints by any of these tracks or up that steep hill. I know something is going on up there. This was back in the year of 1976, in the wintertime. November to be exact, in the Los Angeles County. First, as a matter of background, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. It will help explain the delay in ever having reposted this. The sighting occurred about three months prior to my entering the United States Army. I served for three years as a paratrooper with top secret clearance. After my time in the service, I became a Los Angeles police officer. I did that for 13 years and am now a federal agent working for an OIG out of Washington DC. With that background, you can probably understand my reluctance to discuss this sighting with too many people. It really boils down to a potential career killer. That being said, the incident did occur and I remember it vividly. Many, many years after the event. I reconnected with my friend, the witness, and asked him to tell me the story as he recalled it. I wanted to check my memory and see if it matched to mine. It did, to a T. Only a few months ago, I spoke with my brother-in-law, a witness after the fact. I asked him if he remembered the events, and he did. It should be known that he is not the kind of person that would buy into such a story. 
he had not been semi-involved. Anyway, this is what happened. My friend Craig and I were both 17 years old and waiting to leave for Army basic training. He was due to leave in June, and I would go in August of 1980. We were staying with my sister and brother-in-law at the time. They lived in a cabin in Green Valley, California. Craig and I enjoyed our last months as civilians in that area and used it to train for the difficult training ahead of us. We ran every day along the mountain roads and hiked the hills, trying to get into prime shape. In May, we decided to test ourselves and camp out for a full seven days. We knew the perfect place for this would be what we called the old campground because of its isolated surroundings and terrain that would be perfect for climbing and hiking. So, we packed up a week's worth of supplies, and though my sister Cindy and her husband Tom offered to drive us, we decided to act like soldiers and walk to the location. We did this with full packs. My sister and Tom advised us that they would check in on us at least every other day, and that they would bring us food and lemonade and such. Tom also offered to provide us with two weapons to be used for protection against any strangers that may try to harm us. After all, this was before cell phones and we would be on our own big time. There was also a heavy rattlesnake threat in the area, so we happily took him up on the offer. Tom met us up at that area near the mine shafts later that day and gave us an M1 rifle and a 12 gauge shotgun, ammo for both. The dirt trail that leads off the main highway goes very far back into the mountains. In fact, were you to traverse it to its end, you would end up on what is known as Grass Mountain. Craig and I decided to get about three miles in and away from the highway, which was about a mile past what was once an old 1920s campground and lived deep in the bush like soldiers would. We found a great spot next to a clear running creek and set up our tent in the clearing that was there. This clearing was completely surrounded by thick woods. Then, night fell. As we lay in our tent talking by the light of flashlights, we both heard the very loud snap of deadfall in the woods behind the tent. We sat up, frozen and listening. We heard what sounded like a very large and heavy person slowly walking around our sight, making no effort to conceal his presence. Judging from the loud sound of breaking sticks and brush, we were both scared that somebody was out there. We exited the tent, Craig with a shotgun and me with the M1. I started yelling very loudly, Hey, we know you are there. We have guns and we'll shoot. Again, we heard the sound of somebody walking slowly, but methodically around from our left to right. We shined our lights in the direction but could not see anything but the trees and brush. We talked amongst ourselves, wondering if it could be a bear or something, but we decided that it was a person and not an animal. After much yelling and warning that we would shoot, I decided to fire a few rounds in the direction of the noise. How crazy that sounds now, and I did just that. I fired about three rounds into the trees, and the sound was unbelievable. The weapon blasted the sound and echoed into the night, roaring into the canyons and fading off into the night air. We stood in silence. To our utter disbelief and eventual horror, whatever it was, began to move again, still left to right, in a circle around us. What we both thought and discussed later was that no animal would have stuck around after that horrific noise of the M1. Most normal people would have not stuck around either. Whoever or whatever was out there not only stuck around, but appeared from the casual sound of the slow walking to be less than concerned about our weapons. We made a decision to vacate the area post haste. Grabbing our coats, we climbed the embankment up the dirt road, carrying our weapons. We ran the entire way, about three miles more or less back to the main highway. We spent a very long night curled up in a concrete drainage ditch, waiting for the sun to rise. Every hour or so, a lone truck would come by, and the sound of that brought us comfort. Again, it was a long night. The next day, we hiked back to the site, expecting to find our tent and all of our supplies missing. To our surprise, everything was as we had left it. Nothing was out of place. 
We gathered our things and hiked back to an open area of an old campground. We decided not to sleep in the tent because it limited our vision and instead laid our sleeping bags out in the area, open above the creek. After a day of climbing cliffs and cooking and such, night fell again. That night, just as the sun set and darkness was beginning to fall, Craig and I were walking in the direction of the main road. We were looking for rattlesnakes because we had shot one earlier on the dirt road in the same area. As we walked side by side with me on the left, both holding weapons, we saw it. Standing just on the dirt road, facing us was a Bigfoot. There can be no doubt at all about what I saw. We could see it was very clearly a Bigfoot. He was about eight or nine feet tall and stood with his left shoulder even with the edge of the trail. He was covered with dark hair and had long arms. We did not smell anything unusual as I have since read about other sightings. The strange thing about him was the absolute indifference in his expression. He did not look threatening. He did not look scared. He just stood there looking at us, almost bored. I instinctively brought my right hand up against Craig's chest and we both stopped dead in our tracks. We never took our eyes off the Bigfoot as we spoke. I said, do you see that? Are we seeing this? And Craig said, what do we do? What should we do? We both started to walk backwards as we spoke, very slowly and involuntarily. The Bigfoot just looked at us for a few moments. Then, and I will never forget the detail of this, he just slowly and very casually turned to his left and began to walk into the forest. When he did that, Craig and I stopped and started talking over each other. Do we shoot it? Should we shoot it? What do we do? Do you want to follow it? As we talked, we heard a sound that we both immediately recognized from the prior night. The sound of the Bigfoot slowly walking deeper into the woods, breaking deadfall, twigs and branches as he went. We never did fire a shot or follow him. We stayed up late and slept in shifts at the campground and did not hear from the Bigfoot again. The next day, Tom came up with food and supplies. We ran to him and told him the details of what had happened. It was very clear by his expression that he did not believe us. We took him to the exact spot where we saw the Bigfoot and we discovered a trail of giant footprints leading from the trail into the woods. Tom smiled and told us that we did a good job making them. We were so frustrated and begged Tom to follow the tracks with us. We all followed them and they went into and across the creek. On the other side, we found a large red anthill with a footprint right on top of it. I asked Tom, how could we have done that? He just shook his head and smiled. We followed the tracks to a point where two large hills formed a valley that sloped upwards into the mountain area. The ground turned rocky and the prints stopped. This is what happened. I have lived with this memory for many years. I am now 45 years old and am less concerned about what people think of me in terms of this incident. It is a fact and because of it, I know for sure that Bigfoot lives or at least once lived in the area in Green Valley, California. Me and a friend at the time were hiking in the Angeles National Forest. My friend was just at a boot camp, USMC, and we started hiking as often time would allow. We were hiking down a small stream bed that went downhill. The stream was all dried up and it was mostly rock hopping until we got to the bottom of the hill. At one point, there is a small section off to the side that is just dirt and makes for a much easier walk down to the bottom. When we got to the bottom, we hiked a bit more, but as the sun started to go down, we headed back up the same hill creek bed. I followed my own boot tracks back up as I was tired of rock hopping while going up. The smell in the air was horrible, like rotten eggs or a portable toilet. I then noticed on one of my tracks laid a dead ground squirrel right over my boot track. I pointed this out to my friend and as soon as I did, a loud banging over a short hillside was heard. It was coming from about 35 to 50 yards away from us. It sounded as if a large log was being hit against a tree. 
I looked at where the noise was coming from and noticed the tops of the trees were swaying back and forth. All this time of the swaying of the trees, the pounding on them could be heard. Then the pounding stopped and a loud groan scream was heard from the same area as the pounding of the trees. I have never heard anything like it. I have heard mountain lions, black bear. This was nothing like that and was very, very loud to the point that where it was damn scary. My friend asked if we should go look over the small hillside to see what was making the noise. I said no way, and he agreed. When we started walking away, the banging and the screaming would stop, but as soon as we stopped, it would then proceed with the groan and screaming, and the trees would start swaying. We finally got out of there, and my friend did not want to talk about what happened. This is what you might call a stretch, but here goes anyway. About 15 years ago, when I was 17 or 18, I went on a hike with a friend trying to reach Smith Mountain on the edge of the San Gabriel Wilderness. We made it up to the saddle where the trail goes downhill into the wilderness and where we were supposed to leave the trail and go south of the mountain and decided we didn't feel like going any further. I'm assuming we rested for a while and I remember just talking and hanging out. As we were getting up and ready to go, we heard a strange noise coming from the bushes nearby. We stopped talking and listened, and it was a very low sort of growl snuffling sound. My first thought was that it was probably a bear, but that ultimately I had no idea what it was, and it sounded like it was growling at us. The bushes along the trail were very high, such so that we couldn't see through them, it scared the hell out of us, and so we quickly hoofed it back down the trail. I'm not sure if we ever spoke about it again, except to maybe say I wonder what it was, that it was scary. But afterwards, I actually looked through the field guides trying to figure out what was making the noise. I knew that bears, mountain lions, and bobcats all relatively are prevalent in that part of San Gabriel Mountains, so assumed it was probably one of those. But after browsing around, and seeing several sightings near that wilderness area, I'm beginning to wonder. In retrospect, although it could be my overactive imagination, it sounded a bit ape-like, very low-pitched, so that we almost couldn't hear it at all, and we had to ask each other, do you hear that? Take it as you must. I just think it's interesting in the context of the other sightings. I only wish I could remember any more details, and that we had the cojones to hang around longer and to check it out further. In 1976, while night hunting for bobcats on the fringe of San Gabriel Wilderness, I called in a Bigfoot while using a dying rabbit call. I heard it scream so loud that the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I got goosebumps all over my whole body. I have been hunting now for 34 years, and besides hunting eight of the 11 western states, I've also hunted deep in the interior of Mexico, and I have never heard anything like that before. It was the only time I have ever been truly frightened. Even though I had a high-powered rifle, I knew by the sheer volume of the blood-curdling scream that whatever it was was too big to kill with my 243 caliber bullet. It sounded like it was mad at me and kept moving to my right, trying to get downwind of me. I figured that my very powerful aircraft landing light that I was using to hunt with must have blinded him and hurt his eyes because he was circling me, trying to win me. He never looked my way, thus allowing me to catch his glowing eyes. This is the first of three so-called sightings. Me and my fishing buddy, Greg, were fishing the backside of Morris Dam knocking stuff out of smallmouth bass and an occasional huge trout or crappie. It's not legal to trespass there, so we were very quiet and did not use lights. We are one with nature, so to speak. At around four in the morning, we started back to the car, a quarter mile walk through dense brush across the river up to waist deep. We used deer trails like tunnels to get through the thick brush. We grabbed our hefty stringer, no fish story, and headed into the bush, without really speaking. We knew the routine well. About 50 yards into the bush, 
Greg and I both noticed that someone, a human, was walking in front of us, about 20 feet ahead. We both stopped. The footsteps took two more steps, and then stopped. Greg and I looked at each other, surprised and simultaneously drew our buck knives. We couldn't see anything. We proceeded cautiously, our knives drawn. The footsteps continued in front of us. After about 30 feet, we came to the edge of a clearing and stopped. Two more steps, and it stopped again, only this time in the middle of the clearing. We looked at each other, looked back at it, and simultaneously said, who's there? It turned 90 degrees up the river and took off running through dense brush in the black of night, like a halfback for the rams, like no human can. This early 1970s sighting was not of my own. I was a boy when my brother-in-law of that day and one or two of his hunting friends had an excellent and fairly long-term sighting, both via their eyes through high-powered rifle scopes. However, I can relate some of this information to you. In fact, I spoke with my ex-brother-in-law about this earlier this evening because I happened upon it and wanted to explore this encounter. What is very significant is that Sam and Don had every opportunity to shoot this animal and or person and thought about it, but could not because it looked too human. Only three days later, Bigfoot reports hit the news. My father and Sam, aka Sandy, in front of me, took out a forest map and Sam became quiet as the new sightings were only 15 miles from his encounter and in the direction the creature was traveling. The newer sightings, as I recall, put the creature near Pear Blossom, on the other side of the mountains. I remember a news report of a thousand people lined up across the desert looking for anything and they did find some hair on a barbed wire fence. To this day, I know of no one having reported this first encounter three days prior. Another significant item is that in those days, bear season and deer season overlapped or was one in the same. At first, they thought this might be a deformed bear they had bear tags, as they witnessed this being walking on two legs, just like any human, and appeared to be around eight feet tall. They were a few hundred yards away on the other side of the canyon. I don't remember the name of the canyon, but the rifle scopes allow them to see this clearly enough that viewing the face and shape, they could not decide if this was an animal or a human. I remember Sandy, or Sam, saying it looked kind of like a monkey man. The animal person seemingly did not know they were there. They had bear tags and thought about shooting the creature, but as I said, could not make themselves to do it. I recall Sam telling my father that it had to be a bear because it dropped down to all fours when it climbed the steeper terrain. My father asked Sam, how did you guys climb it? The reply was the same as a deformed bear. About then, my brother-in-law was no longer jovial regarding the sighting and preferred not to discuss the incident. Until now, I have more or less left the man alone about it. Today, he is a plant manager for a large trailer company. Don still lives in Baldwin Park, California, but may be moving to San Diego. I seldom cross paths with Don, nor have I ever pursued the matter with him. If anybody is interested, I was mining on the creek when some movement caught my eye. As I stood up, I saw clear as day, a Bigfoot peering from behind a tree. The hair on my neck stood straight up on the back of my neck as I moved back towards across the creek, away from it. As I did, I slipped on mossy rocks, fell back and banged my arm up pretty bad which required medical attention later on, keeping a close eye on what it was doing. I know exactly what I saw as well as it saw me. We were talking about a distance of 60 yards. My mining partner was upstream from us and it knew that too, as he kept looking upstream looking for him. My friend must have spooked it my way. As it spotted me, already acting nervous, it leapt up and climbed over some rocks and was gone. As it knew to stay low, like it was in firefight, staying as much out of sight as possible, in panic and injured, I was heading up the trail as fast as I could. The behavior I observed was so fascinating that this thing was very tactful and knew exactly what it was doing. Quite the sure-footed creature. <laughs> 